Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by Enron Foundation, Robert J. Kutak Foundation, and public television stations. Niobrara River, which flows out of the west across the high plains of northern Nebraska, runs freely through the rich land. For generations, the Ponca Indians lived peaceably along its green banks. But in 1877, the United States government confiscated their land and marched this small band of about 500 people south to the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. A number of Ponkas died on the trip. For those who lived, the way of life there was shockingly different. The tribe found government food rations sadly inadequate. There was insufficient clothing for the cold, wet winter. of all ages became sick, and many died. <laughs> Among those who became ill was Bear Sheaf, the only son of Chief Standing Bear and his wife, Suzette. We don't even know what to get for him. On the Niobrara, the old people knew all the plants. They could make medicines. But down here, the plants were all different. If I die, will you bury me where the old people are buried? I will. Not here. Bear me along the Nile, Brera. You won't die. <laughs> promise me. I promise. Sleep now. Sleep. We need rest to get stronger. Hey, hey, hey. 
We have decided it's time to leave this place. Anyone who wants to go with us, come back to our land. We have little food or money, and it will take us many weeks. If the soldiers catch us, then we will fight. We will not fight. They can do what they please with us. Whatever they do, it can't be worse than to stay here. You can't leave now. The agent will find out tomorrow. And tell the government. The government will send the army to find you. They will bring you back. I made a promise to my son. It's time to go home. We are a tribe. We are one here. If you go... No more talk. We are going. The white man will drag you back, or you will die out there. People die here, too. At least we choose where to die. January 2nd, 1879, 30 Pankas departed from the Indian Territory. They took only two wagons, a few rations, and $20. They left behind family and friends whom they feared they would never see again.
exciting settlements and main travel roads, the Poncas moved seven or eight miles a day across the plains. As they were crossing Kansas, Standing Bear approached a frightened immigrant family. We want to buy some corn. You want to buy corn? Please. Anna, get some bread. These people are hungry. The family shared what little they had with the starving Indians and the Poncas pushed on toward the north. In mid-March, the Poncas approached the Omaha Reservation. They had been traveling for 10 weeks. This for which we are about to receive, we give thanks.
With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Reverend! Please, Willie. There's somebody coming. Willie, I'm busy. For as off as ye eat this bread, and drink. Good Lord. Standing there. What are you doing here? We are coming home. We need to rest. Then we will go. There are only a few of us. Where in hell did you come from? Did you come all the way from Indian Territory? Yes. All the way from Indian Territory. That's over 500 miles. We know. He will be happy here. He's just resting for a while. Like us. So many things are different. To carry the dead with us so far. It's necessary. I know. It's just that I sometimes wonder if there's anything we can do to make him rest in the other world. We're doing what we can. The Omaha are good to us. They think we should live with them. It's not much further home. Maybe, maybe we are home. Maybe this is as far as we're supposed to come. You want to leave him here? We could take him there and bury him and then come back. We could live here. If we can live here, we can live anywhere, anywhere we choose, or anywhere they choose for us. We have to ask for our land back. It's our one firm place to stand. Even if it's away from most of our people? Yes. Even if it's away. Several weeks, the Omahas concealed from the government the presence of the Ponkas on their reservation. Standing Bear. Daisy, where's the field you plowed and planted yesterday? I don't see it. I'm sharpening my plow to cut into the snow to find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good we planted before this spring storm. A farmer's life is hard. I feel I could plow the whole world, I think. Make a big farm. Feed everybody. Will you feed the white man? What about the white man? Will you feed him? I'll feed everybody. Well, don't feed Long Runner first, or there won't be any left. <laughs> Sandy Bear, it's good to be here among the Omaha. 
You think the army has forgotten all about us? No. Map. Standing there? Yes. I'm Lieutenant Carpenter. I have orders from General Crook to arrest you and your band of Poncas and to escort you to Fort Omaha. Are the rest of these Poncas? Yes. If you give me your word you'll come along peaceably, I won't have to use restraints. Why do we have to go to the fort? You're to be held there before going back to Indian territory. We won't go back there. Quiet. We won't? You can tell your general to shoot us now. Now, we don't want any trouble. Just come along quietly. No! Men. Peacefully. We will go peacefully. Standing Bear, I've received orders from General Philip Sheridan of Chicago directing me to return you and your people to the Indian Territory, which you left improperly and illegally two and a half months ago. General Sheridan received these orders from General Sherman in Washington. You understand? It is my government's wish you go back to the Indian Territory. My people are not strong enough to go back now. And our horses are lame. You can stay here at the fort until your people are stronger. It's a government order. Do you have any questions? That's all. Lieutenant.
never fought. The white man should love us. Instead, he has taken away our land, houses, and horses. The Sioux fought. Now they have our land. You have not done so badly. They'll take us back south soon. Unless we can find a way to fight. How can we fight anyone? I don't know. But somehow we have to find a way. We should go in. I'm Thomas H. Tibbles. May I sit down? I'm from the newspaper, the uh, Omaha Daily Herald. I'd very much like to interview you. You must be uh, Deje. I'm pleased to meet you. I've already talked to Lieutenant Carpenter and some others. He says you people have walked all the way up here from the Indian Territory, is that right? And um, now you'll be going back, right? I mean, that's what he says. The Lieutenant did say you spoke English. Yes, we do. If you're angry or have a story to tell, a newspaper is a pretty good way to get your feelings across. I mean, if you've got anything in the way of complaints, We're dying. <laughs> You're dying? What do you mean by that? Down south, in Indian territory, my people are dying. How many of your people? One in three. One in three? How? Sickness, bad water, no food. No tools. No money. Well, what's being done about it? Nothing. I'd like to hear the whole story. If you wish. It began a long time ago, when the government forced us to go down south. And before we leave this morning, Mr. Thomas Tibbles of the Omaha Daily Herald has something he would like to say to you. Thank you, Reverend Wyatt. Good morning. Tom, why don't you come up here where everyone can see you? There has been 
an absolutely shameful policy by the U.S. government toward the Ponca Indians. We removed them forcibly from land that was rightfully theirs and gave it to the Sioux. We marched this peaceful band of 500 souls south to the Indian Territory where more than a third of their number has died in the last two years. We did this. Whites. Christians. Now a few have come back to Nebraska. What do they want? To farm. Where? On their ancestral lands, the lands we once promised them they would own forever. What is our response? We arrest them, jail them, and prepare to send them south again. My fellow citizens, no Indian ever stole a white man's land. No Indian ever confined a white man to a reservation against his will. Yet we are the ones who call them savages. I received a telegram today from General Sherman. It directs me to take you and your people south no later than the end of the week. Whether your horses are healthy, whether your people are healthy, whatever, it's a government order. My people have always cooperated with your government. We have lived peaceably with all men. We have never committed any crime. Eight days ago, I was at work on land which the Omahas gave me. I had sowed some spring wheat and wished to sow more. I was arrested and brought here as a prisoner. Does your law do that? I've been told since the Great War that all men were free and that no man could be made a prisoner unless he does wrong. I have done no wrong, and yet I'm here a prisoner. Have you a law for the white men and a different law for those who are not white? All we can do is give you what provisions you will require on your way down. You will be permitted to take your stock with you and you can go slowly. It is a most disagreeable task to send you down there, but I must obey orders. My editorials are being printed in the Eastern papers, John. Here's what the Tribune says. They're coming out on my side. The people of Omaha, the churches, they all support the Ponkers. No one here wants them sent back, but they're going back, no matter what we say. Before anyone has a chance to really use his influence. I'm not sure anything could influence Washington. Something has to. This government keeps treating Indians as though they weren't human. The law isn't much help. Washington can move these Indians wherever it thinks best. Can it? John. What if we took the army to court? 
right now, before they can do anything. Could we force the army to release the Ponkas? On what grounds? I don't know. On the grounds that they haven't done anything wrong? They left the reservation. They haven't hurt anybody. Do you mean you want me to seek a writ of habeas corpus to ask the judge whether it's lawful for General Crook to arrest and hold the Ponkas? Tom, is this your idea? Well, it was suggested to me. Indians haven't done well in American courts. I know that. But what other choice is there? All right. But I'll need some help. Oh. No. <laughs> I'll take the case without a fee. But it's too big for me to handle alone. We need someone who can command the respect of the judge. What do you think of A.J. Poppleton. Poppleton? The railroad lawyer? Why on earth would you want him? Because when the judge looks down from that bench, he needs to see more than just Standing Bear's lawyers. He needs to see a leading representative of Omaha, the Union Pacific. In fact, all of Nebraska society staring back at him. Would Poppleton do it? We better hope he will. Standing Bear, Mr. Webster and Mr. Poppleton are lawyers. They want to help you. They want to go into court with you. And, well, um, sue the army, a crook, specifically for your release. We can do that. We can try. If we win, you'll go free. All of you. And if we lose? You'll be no worse off. Why should the white man let us win in his court? He may not be able to help it. That's the way the law works sometimes. This is the paper you need to sign. It's a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. There isn't a lot of time. We have to do this today. The white man's court. It is a way to fight. One thing troubles me. What? Why must it be General Crook that I am suing? Well, that's just the way the law works. You're really suing the government, but you have to name him as defendant. Won't it make him angry? Uh, no, it won't. Why not? Because he's a soldier and a damn fine man. He respects the Indians because he's fought enough of them. Have they located Judge Dundee yet? 
He's out on a bear hunt. A bear hunt? I've sent someone after him. If he doesn't get back soon, the army could ship these people out before they get a hearing. Hope the judge has already got his bear. the undersigned asks to be released from said writ and that said Indians may be returned to him for the fulfillment of his orders concerning them. And you sign again right here, General? Very good. You notarize this, please? Well, there's the return. And this is your official response to Standing Bear's lawsuit. Does it sound all right to you? I wasn't listening. It just says you're acting on orders. Good. We'll file this with Judge Dundee and be in and out of court in no time, assuming the judge even gets here. Do you think Standing Bear can win? He hasn't got a case. You're going to be sending these Indians south very soon. Does that please you? No, but it's my job to try this case. And I'd no sooner be derelict in my duties than you would be in yours, General. This is a constitutional question, after all. They're attacking the Constitution. How? In trying to be covered by it. They're trying to be Americans. They're not. Technically, the law doesn't even think they're people. What the hell does it think they are? Take your pick. Foreigners, wards. Foreigners have rights. They can sue. That's right. But Indians are foreigners, and they're not foreigners. They live here. Always have. So that makes them more like wards of the state. A little like a child is the ward of its parents. But can a child sue its parents? No. That's right. He's not competent to. Mr. Lambertson, are you telling me these people who trekked across the Great Plains in winter aren't competent? Not in a court of law. understand what we've been talking about. I think so. It's important that you really understand. We'll call you as a witness. Others will question you, too. Our way of life must change. There are some of us who believe in the old traditions, who think that great spirits will be displeased with them if they do like white men. They want to hold on to the old ways. But if we are to survive, we must live like white men. Do you consider yourself a chief of those you're with? Are you a chief at all? No more. And why not? The white man wants every Indian to wear a bonnet and be a chief. But this is not so. We all froze 
and starve together. Now I am like the others. Standing there, do you understand why we need to know how you think about these things? Deje, do you understand? DJ? I am Punka. Well, yes. That's your tribe. You were born a Ponca, but we're speaking of the future here, of what you intend to be. I am Ponka. Do you want me to say a lie? No, no. Not a lie. A way of looking at things. Do I look like a white man? Deji, let us explain this better, all right? We, whites, that is, have a law called the Constitution. And it says that men are free, but some men it doesn't talk about. Black men, black slaves, for instance, they weren't free until the 14th Amendment. It, it get to the point, John. Well, that's been fixed now, and black men are free, more or less, just like whites. But the Constitution still doesn't talk about Indians. Now, Mr. Poppleton and I can't write new words into the Constitution, neither can the judge, but we can suggest that if you choose to leave your tribe and live where white men live and farm like white men, then the law has to treat you more like a white man. It has to let you go. To be free, we have to say that we're not Indians? Not Indians in a tribe. I am a punker. We know that, but I am a punker and a man like other men. If you can see that we are men, that we are punka, and also men, why can't the law see this? The law is trying to see, but in the past, it's always treated you more as, well, as children. Children? than the law as a child. Yes, you could put it like that. You might say John and I, well, all of us here, are trying to help the law grow up a little. You want us to help the white man's law grow up? I want you to be free if you truly are prepared to make the change you're talking about, I want all of you to be free. Well, that's settled. Well, has anyone found Judge Dundee? Judge Dundee. Morning. Where are the petition and return for the standing bear case? Right here, sir. How was the hunt, Judge? Did you get? No, I did not get my bear. The 
Army hasn't tried to sneak these Indians out of here, have they? No, sir. Well, that's good. Oh, well, that's very good. T tell me, have you met Standing Bear? Yes, briefly. Ah, well, what do you think? He's... He's impressive, sir. Impressive? Impressive. Well, he better be. If we say we're not Indians, can we ever visit our relatives? Why do you ask that? Only Indians are allowed on reservations. If we say we're white. I had not thought of that. White man's law's a crazy thing. What do you think you'll say in court? That I am a man. If you do say we'll live like whites, what chances there we'll go free? About the size of a wheat grain. So small. Standing Bear, this is someone you should meet. This is Mr. Hackberry from the Indian Commissioner's Office in Washington. Mr. Hackberry, this is Standing Bear. And this is? Sorry, DG. This is DG. I've heard of you, sir. I've heard of little else since this lawsuit began. Thank you, Lieutenant. I'll be fine. Yes, indeed. Your lawsuit is causing quite a stir back in Washington. It's the reason I'm here, to tell the truth. I want to talk to you. What about? About the fact that you can't win. We can win. For the first time, I know it. How? You have come. If we could not win, you would not be here. really knows. Courts can be erratic. But tell me, have you thought of the problems you'll have if you do win? What problems? Nowhere to go, for one. You wouldn't be allowed on reservation land anymore. And since the Sioux have your old land, that would certainly be off limits to you. We will find our own land. Without money, without tools, Clothes, houses, medicine. You forget how much we provide on the reservation. Forget to provide. There have been mistakes in the past, I admit that. Breakdowns. Our office takes care of a lot of people. We do our best, believe me. We try to keep your tribes together. We've done a pretty good job in that, I think. Now, you folks are splitting up a tribe. That makes the commissioner very unhappy. Now, you've done a brave thing walking up here in winter. You've impressed the commissioner. I doubt if there'd be any more trouble in getting what your tribe needs, provided you're willing to head back down there. That's lovely over there. What 
is it? It's a song about the bravery of the punka. Our children need to learn these things. It's lovely. You know, when tribes split up, it's hard to keep traditions going. Hard to maintain a way of life. Indians belong in tribes. It's their strength. We have many kinds of strength. Well, you consider what I've told you, all right? I'll be here in town as long as I need to be. Consider it carefully. General, are you ready? For this? Never. Well, it shouldn't take long. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Are we all set? Pretty much. Oh, uh, General, the Indian Commissioner sends his greetings. He does, does he? Yes. He said to tell you that he's glad he can depend upon your sense of duty at times like these. Thank him for me. I will. Do we feel lucky today? Always feel lucky before a trial. You might not get the chance later. <laughs> It's never easy to set a precedent, Tom. It all depends on Standing Bear. He has to be convincing when he says he wants to live like a white man. Out of the way. Out of the way, please. Out of the way. The Circuit Court for the District of Nebraska is now in session. The Honorable Judge Elmer Dundee presiding. In the matter of Standing Bear and Other Ponca Indians versus George Crook, a Brigadier General in the United States Army. And I have read the petition and the return. I believe we are now ready to hear witnesses. I would like to call Willie Hamilton to the stand. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. You may be seated. Where do you live? At the Omaha Agency. Uh, that's where I've lived for the last 12 years. And what are you engaged in at the agency? Uh, for the last six years, I've been in the store uh, selling goods. Do you know the parties currently under arrest at Fort Omaha? I do. Uh, the Ponkas. In what condition did these Ponca Indians arrive at the Omaha Agency? Well, very bad. They, they were sick, starving. 
Do you know where that came from? The Indian Territory. How'd they get up here? Well, some on horseback, some on wagons. Some had to walk. Walk? How far a walk is that? Well, 500 miles or so. 500 miles? Objection, Your Honor. We all know how far it is to the Indian Territory. Besides, the distance is not material. Sustained. Did they attend church while with the Omahas? Objection. Irrelevant. Are questions of religion necessary, Mr. Webster? The theory of this government is to Christianize these Indians, I believe. Very well. Objection overruled. Mr. Hamilton? Uh, some went to church, some didn't. Um, about the same as white folks. Did they plant crops? A few. Some planted a little wheat. Most were too sick. Would you say, if they had been healthier, most of the Poncas would have tried to farm just like white men in the spring? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Don't leave the witness, Mr. Webster. I apologize, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. You may cross-examine Mr. Lambertson. Who was the chief of the Poncas? Standing Bear is chief, head chief of the tribe, but Dejay's a chief, too. You don't know much about these Indians' lives down in the Indian Territory, do you, Mr. Hamilton? I guess a bunch of them died. That's why Standing Bear and his people left. Let's stick to Standing Bear. Uh, he was their acknowledged chief, you say? Yes, sir. And he and Deje and one or two others managed and controlled the Indians? That's right. Each one controlled his own band. Now, they came to the Omaha agency as friends of the Omahas, as fellow Indians? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. You may conduct your redirect examination, counsel. Did the Omahas have any objections to the Poncas staying on their land? No, sir. The Omahas liked the Poncas. Uh, they were willing to have them come and take part of their land and try to become citizens like they were trying to do. Mr. Hamilton, were the Poncas ever a part of the Omaha tribe? No, sir. They've intermarried some over the years, though. Thanks. Counsel? Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. You may recross. State whether these Indians submitted themselves to the authority of the Omaha Indians. They took advice from them. So they submitted themselves to the same rules, customs, and habits as the Omahas? Yes, sir. That's right, they did. You look like you're enjoying yourself. Just doing my job. Do the Omahas have any chiefs? Uh, not now. They all just advise together, sort of. They live like white men, then, in that sense. They try to. You may step down, Mr. Hamilton. I would like to call Lieutenant Carpenter. How's it going? Raise your right hand. Lambertson pretty well proved that these people are still looking at themselves as a band of Indians with a tribal leader. Our whole point is that they're a small group of individuals who've left their tribe. I see. Mm. Lieutenant Carpenter. When you arrested the Poncas, were they wearing citizens, that is, white men's clothes? Most of the men wore citizens' clothing. Only two, I think, wore blankets and leggings. And did you, by conversation or otherwise, acquire any knowledge as to what the habits of the Poncas had been at the Omaha agency? Objection, Your Honor. Incompetent, immaterial, irrelevant. Sustained. 
After you brought the Indians to Fort Omaha, did they continue to wear citizens' clothing? Some of them wore the same clothing they're wearing now. Sit down, John. This isn't leading anywhere. You can't prove they're civilized by their clothing. That's all, Your Honor. Counsel? How many chiefs of the Pankas are there? Objection. Improper cross-examination. The subject was not covered by Mr. Webster's questions. Sustained. State the names of the parties arrested. Objection. Immaterial. Besides, it's already in the record. Mr. Lambertson, why do you think it's material? To show these Indians have chiefs, Your Honor, to whom they profess allegiance. Uh, to do that, you would have to make the witness your own. Objection is sustained. No more questions, Your Honor. You may stand down, Lieutenant Carpenter. Your Honor, we would now like to call Standing Bear as a witness. Does this court think an Indian is a competent witness? They are competent for all purposes in both civil and criminal courts. The law makes no distinction on account of race, color, or previous condition. You may call Standing Bear, Mr. Webster. However, I'm going to call an early recess. Court will reconvene at the usual time for the afternoon session. Why do you suppose Standing Bear dressed the way he did today? Who knows? It certainly makes it harder to show he's not an Indian. <laughs> That's the truth. It has one advantage, though. What's that? Makes it easier to show he's human. The quality of his testimony is what's going to decide this case. Nothing else. Well, I hope he's convincing. That damned Lambertson is working awfully hard to win. It's a hard habit for a lawyer to break. How did you come to lose your Ponca lands and end up down in the Indian Territory? Why don't you tell us that story? Objection. The inquiry here is solely whether these Ponkas have dissolved tribal relations. We don't care to hear their whole life history. They don't dare to hear it. We don't care to hear. I mean, it's not strictly relevant. I'll withdraw my question, Your Honor. How many of you were taken south down to the Indian Territory? About 500. The whole tribe? Yes. When did the whole tribe go down there? How long ago? Two years. In that two years, how many of the Poncas have died down there in the Indian Territory out of the original 500? Many got sick. But how many died? 158. So, about one out of every three. Yes. Why? Tell us the story. 
Your Honor, I would like direct questions to the witness, please, not invitations to tell a story. Mr. Webster, would you please ask... When we got down there, the land was no good for farming. It was all stones. We couldn't plow or sow any wheat. They told us we would get clothing and money and, and help. But it never came. We got sick. I don't know what made us sick. Water? Or having no food? Maybe it was losing our home. I thought if I go back to my old land, maybe we would get well. I got as far as the Omaha's. But you have brought me here. What have I done? I am brought here, but what have I done? Standing there. I have nowhere to go. I see your faces. I think some of you are trying to help me. I need a place to live. I need a place to die. Silence, silence. Counsel, I cannot have your client lecturing and arguing his own case. Sorry, Your Honor. Standing there. How many of your children died in the Indian Territory? Two. My daughter and my son. My son could write. He was a great help. Whenever I think of it, it makes me... Will he mention his son's dying request? I hope not. I thought we needed sympathy. Not now. It would look rehearsed. What did you and those who came back with you mean to do? How did you mean to earn a living? Objection, Your Honor. This question is immaterial. Overruled, counsel. I'm going to allow the question. I think it strikes at the very center of the case. If the Ponkers intend to live on the Omaha reservation like Indians, that's one thing. If they intend to leave their tribe and earn their living like white men, that's something very different. Standing Bear, what did you intend to do? I wanted to work like a white man. I thought if I came north and could get my land back, go to work, I could live that way. When you left the tribe, did you intend to stay away? I would go back to visit, not to stay. How did you intend to go about becoming civilized, like a white man, I mean? I have seen many white people. I see them work, farm, build houses. That is what I did before removal. That is what I want to do now. That's the reason you left? Yes. Did the others who came away with you intend the same? Objection, Your Honor. The question is incompetent. He could not know that. He may state if he knows. They all wanted to do the same. If you were released from your imprisonment, would you go back to the tribe? What would you do? Objection. I'll withdraw the question, Your Honor. After you left the Indian Territory, did you intend to continue to exercise your powers as chief? 
Or did all of you simply act together as friends? Objection. That question is leading. Overruled. Counsel, we have to allow a little leeway here in view of the great difficulties in determining the nature of this group. I will allow him to answer the question. I did not consider myself as chief. I was like the rest. Did you send your children to school? Objection. Sustained. Sit down. You're ahead. No further questions, Your Honor. Before we hear cross-examination, I would like to call a recess. Counsel for the government has sent me a note requesting more time to prepare himself. If there's no objection? No, Your Honor. Very well. I promised counsel I would hold evening sessions if necessary. I prefer to hear a case straight through whenever I can. Therefore, let us resume session at 7.30 tonight. General, this evening's session should be critical to us. When you and your friend, Tibbles, conspired to set up this lawsuit, you didn't realize what you were getting into, did you? Tibbles and me? Why, what would make you say that, A.J.? Eh, General... I've suspected the two of you from the moment I read those newspaper clippings. Tibbles had far too much specific information for a mere reporter. Well, no. I won't tell anyone. Just remember, you have to get up pretty early in the morning to fool an old railroad attorney. Once more, were you the chief or the head man over these Ponkas now here and those down in the Indian Territory? I was not the head man. I don't consider myself any better than they are. When you left the Indian Territory, were other members of the Ponca tribe willing to remain? Your Honor, objection, please. Sustained. Did you inform the Indian agent when you decided to leave the government's care and live for yourself? Yes. Many times I told him I wanted to go to someplace new and go to work. You really like working, don't you? It's better than dying. When you left the Indian Territory, did you plan to return to your former reservation? Yes. Why? Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. We will hear why. Why, Standing Bear? If you so wanted to be like a white man, did you want to return to an Indian reservation? It's my land. I never sold it. My son died. He made me promise to bury him on the Niobrara. That is what I wanted to do. I brought his bones with me. If I ever go home, I 
will bury him there. That is where I want to bury him. That is where I want to be buried. No more questions. We will recess until 9 tomorrow morning. No, it's, it's all right, Tom. Opposing counsel brought it out by mistake. We never could have made it that spontaneous. What is wrong? Where were you? In a dream. Where? Try to sleep more. No. Things will be all right. How? In the court, I can't even speak for myself. I try to tell our story. But they turn everything into questions. But you answered well. You told them you wanted to be a white man. <sighs> All I want is to be free. To farm. And be at peace. Is that white? Or Indian? Whether they let us go or not, they never really hear us. Sorry, Your Honor. Hear ye, hear ye, in the matter of Standing Bear versus George Crook, Brigadier General of the United States Army, before Elmer S. Dundee, judge for Nebraska, court will now come to order. The government will now present its case. The government will call no witnesses, Your Honor. No witnesses? Do you have any other kinds of evidence to introduce? Only an amendment we would like to submit for inclusion in the answer previously filed by us justifying the military arrest and detention of the Poncas. Oh? Yes, sir. The original return did not include General Crook's beliefs about the Poncas. My beliefs? Yes. It merely recited the facts of the arrest and the order for detention. We would like the following paragraph to be included in General Crook's published statement that the said complainant, Standing Bear, is chief of the Ponca tribe of Indians, that the other petitioners are members of said tribe, 
that said complainants have not dissolved but still retain their tribal allegiance to the tribal head. Judge Dundee, I protest this action. Uh, counsel, has this amendment been approved by the general? It doesn't need to be, Your Honor. It was ordered by the government. This is outrageous. I never said such a thing. I do not believe it. You need not believe it. It's sufficient that you sign it. Silence. Order. Order. Now, look, I will have order in this court. This is a highly unusual action, Counselor, and it is very clear that General Crook objects to this use of his name. I beg to differ, Your Honor. General Crook is not signing this document as a person. But as a general, as a general, he represents the United States. The position of the United States is his position in this matter. Well, if this is a change the government demands, I will have to honor it unless I have an objection. I object. This is a deliberate blemish on my record. General Crook, I share your concern for your reputation. But signing this amendment is only a reflection of your role as commanding general. It is not a statement of your personal beliefs. But, Your Honor... Have the amendment entered into the record? Yes, sir. <laughs> is this going to hurt us? No. It's an incredible blunder. He couldn't win on the evidence. So he's altered the statement on the return. Win at any cost. Even sacrifice a general. Is that all, Mr. Lambertson? Yes, sir. We're willing to start final arguments. Very well. Mr. Webster? Thank you, Your Honor. Once there were millions of Indians in what is now the United States. Today, only a few hundred thousand remain. In 1865, a treaty promised the Poncas, a tribe which had already been reduced to a fraction of its former size, that they could live on their ancestral lands by the Niobrara in perpetuity. The Poncas who seek this writ wish to return to their own lands. Now, I imagine much will be said by the government about Indians running loose across the United States if these few are allowed to go free. This contention is simply not true. The issue here is whether Standing Bear and the others are free to live on and bury their dead in land they claim as theirs. In 1870, a report by the United States Senate held that Indians who maintained tribal relations, Indians who acknowledged allegiance to tribal authorities, were not citizens because they were subjects of independent nations. However, when tribal relations are dissolved, then an Indian ceases to owe allegiance to the tribal authorities, and he, by that act, owes allegiance to the United States and becomes a citizen. That is exactly what these people have done. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lambertson, you may have the floor. Your Honor, I must begin by paying tribute to Mr. Webster and to his distinguished colleague, Mr. Poppleton, 
for coming to the assistance of these unfortunate people. Surely we see here the finest in Christian charity. But this case is very simple, Your Honor. And I'm afraid the diligent work of these excellent attorneys has been in vain. Mr. Webster has argued that these punkas are citizens of the United States. He has not cited one single case in support of his contention, however. Why? Because there are none. The citizenship of Indians has been the subject of a senatorial investigation, and the resulting finding was against it. The United States stands in the relation of a guardian to these Pankas, indeed to all of the Indians in this country. It therefore decides what's the best for their well-being. Now, a court may disagree with some of those decisions, but it cannot overrule the government and set itself up as a guardian of these Indians in its stead. We believe the evidence demonstrates that Standing Bear is still a Ponca chief, that his band looks upon him as a leader, and that the chief and his band owe allegiance to the Ponca tribe and not the United States government. Thus, they cannot be citizens of the United States. Your Honor, in the celebrated case of Dred Scott, one of the most famous cases ever argued before our highest court, Chief Justice Roger Taney eloquently remarked, the Indian race formed no part of the colonial communities, either in social connections or in government. Indian political communities have always been treated as foreigners, not living under our government. And here again on the Indians. In their then untutored savage state, no one would have thought of admitting them as citizens in a civilized community. Your Honor, even if Indians could be citizens, it does not follow that they are entitled to all the rights of citizens. I quote Justice Taney a final time. Undoubtedly, a person may be a citizen, although he exercises no share in political power. Women and minors who form part of the political family cannot vote. Your Honor, there is no precedent for an Indian claiming rights which women, children, and others in our society cannot exercise. I thank you for your time. You're welcome, counsel. Mr. Poppleton, will you be wanting some of my time as well? Only a little, Your Honor. Oh, thank you. You may proceed. Do the punkers have the right to invoke the writ of habeas corpus and thus protect themselves against false imprisonment? That alone is the issue of this case. I too have been doing some reading on this point and I think I found a helpful opinion. It says, no human being in this country can exercise any kind of public authority which is not conferred by law. By law. That means the power of the military to hold these people must be found in a law. Passed by Congress and signed by the President. It cannot be a rule. 
made by some person in the executive department. Even an Indian commissioner. Yet the gentleman who appears for the government has not chosen to cite that law. On behalf of the innocent, I protest against the power of the military to arrest them. And I think the military itself has a right to protest. What does the law say about the writ of habeas corpus? Well, it says the writ may be used whenever any person is alleged to be in custody in violation of US law. It is not restricted to citizens only. It is there to protect human liberty. <laughs> it is a strange thing to plead for a right that no power, either human or divine, can take from any man. The question, Your Honor, is simply this. Is Standing Bear a person? I would say, Your Honor, that Standing Bear is very much a person in the understanding of the law. And that if, as Mr. Lambertson suggests, no legal precedent as yet exists for issuing a writ on behalf of Indians, then it is high time to make one. May I? Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I would like to conclude with some words from the famous Dred Scott decision, which I was pleased to see counsel for the government holds in such high esteem. Ah, here it is. Chief Justice Taney, it seems, also had this to say about Indians. If an individual should leave his tribe and take up his abode among the white population, he would be entitled to all the rights and privileges which would belong to an emigrant from any other foreign people. Thank you. Again and again, in this court, Standing Bear has demonstrated his wish to live away from his tribe as a white man lives. He wants to make his abode with us. We should welcome him as we welcome someone who is fleeing oppression and death in a foreign country and who has come here seeking freedom. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, if that concludes final arguments, I see no reason why we can't adjourn. I will hand down my decision in a few days. I want to speak. Standing there. You can't speak now. Your Honor, what sort of statement does your client wish to make? I don't know, Your Honor. 
this hand is not the color of yours. But if I pierce it, I will feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you will also feel pain. The blood that flows from mine will be the same color as yours. I am a man. The same God made us both. Your Honor. I will listen. At night, I have a vision. I see myself on the bank of a river. My wife and my little girl are beside me. The river is too wide to swim. Behind us are high cliffs. None of my people have ever stood there before. There is nothing to guide me. The river starts to rise. We turn to the cliffs and begin to climb. There is only a stony path to lead us up. Behind, the river keeps rising. Suddenly, I see a way past the last rocks in the cliffs. We climb up and feel the prairie breeze on our faces. I tell my wife, now, we can go home to the Nyabrara, where the water flows between the green islands. But a man bars the way, a man a thousand times more powerful than me. Behind him are as many soldiers as leaves on a tree. I must obey this man's orders. If he says I cannot pass, then I cannot. My struggle is over. My wife and child and I must return and sink beneath the flood. I cannot fight. You are that man. More coffee, Mr. Poppleton. 
Well, oh, uh, yes, thank you, Eric. How's the family? Fine, thank you, sir. Any word on the case? Not yet. What's taking Judge Dundee so long? He must know that the eyes of the whole country are on him. Maybe that's what's taking him so long. The Eastern press is all for standing there. Well, it's a little different when all you've got is the Constitution and your conscience. During the years I have served this country as a federal judge, I have never been called upon to make a decision on a case that has moved me to compassion as strongly as the case currently before this court. However, laws are made by reason and precedent and not by compassion alone. The district attorney very earnestly questions the jurisdiction of the court to issue the writ and to hear and determine the case herein and has supported his theory with great ingenuity and ability. Nevertheless, I am of the opinion his premises were erroneous and his conclusions wrong and unjust. I have therefore concluded that an Indian is a person and has the right to sue out a writ of habeas corpus where he is restrained of liberty in violation of United States law. I hereby commend General George Crook for his attitude in this case and order him to release his prisoners and rule that no rightful authority exists to remove any of them to the Indian Territory. This court is adjourned. Get it, John. Get it. Well, standing there, we won. I told you we'd win. We almost didn't. I wasn't sure how Judge Dundee was going to react to that speech of yours. It was a good speech. It was a very good speech. Standing there. You won. I'm sorry for you. Sorry for him? What do you mean? Standing Bear will never again be allowed on a reservation. None of these Indians will. I'd say that's something to be sorry for, wouldn't you? Goodbye. Is that true? I'm afraid it is. The Indian commissioner can keep Standing Bear from living on his old land. He can even keep him from visiting other tribes. You do understand that, don't you? You can't live where you used to, along the Niobrara. Then where will I live? Well, in the course of reading the old treaties, I noticed that there are two or three islands in the Niobrara. Well, you probably know about them. That no one has officially laid claim to. I don't see how anyone could bother you there.
He's home. So many have died. And we've walked so far. And we've come such a little way. For a free viewer guide, write Nebraska ETV Information, Post Office Box 83111, Lincoln, Nebraska 68501. Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by Enron Foundation, Robert J. Kutak Foundation, and public television stations.